Hi everyone, I'm Steve Adubato. That is Mary Gamba, a special edition of uh, Lessons in Leadership. Mary, this is an interesting setup. It doesn't look like the normal Lessons in Leadership uh, segment, but we've got some talented leaders and an extremely sure talented do. leader who runs a program that we're a part of, our Stand and Deliver Leadership, a communication program for inner city youth. Talk about it. Absolutely. So first and foremost, welcome. And yes, this is a very special edition of Lessons in Leadership. We are also going to be using it for our sister program one-on-one -on -one, uh, with Steve Adubato, uh, because we're going to be tying it together with our Stand and Deliver Night of Eloquence uh, speakers, presenters. So this program today that we're talking about is a media skills initiative, which was part of our Stand and Deliver Youth Leadership Program. The young adults that you see on screen today, as well as myself and Steve and Tony Richardson, uh, work together with these students over a series of many, many weeks, focusing on things like media skills, communication, making um, eye contact into the camera. So it's my pleasure right now to first and foremost introduce Tony Richardson, who's the project director for Stand and Deliver. Uh, Tony has just been my left hand and right hand for the past 20 years running the program. Uh, we have Ethan De Jesus. Uh, Ethan is uh, just finished his eighth grade year, so he's going to be going into ninth grade, which I still can't believe when you hear him speak that he is in fact that young. Uh, Jeremiah Castillo is in eleventh, uh, was in eleventh grade, and is going to be going into twelfth grade. And then Sean Ye Myers. Uh, who was with us at our Boys and Girls Clubs location. So uh, we will talk uh, more about media skills and really what we've been doing in connection with the PSEG Foundation who made this, uh, you know, the media skills program possible. You know, so, Tony, it's so interesting. We, we had these young leaders as well as a range of others and we talked the media skills. Real quick, before I go to uh, Ethan, what the heck are we doing teaching media skills to 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds. Why, why is that even relevant? First of all, it's never too early to start to become comfortable speaking in front of groups. It is something that you have to do your entire life if you're going to be successful uh, personally and professionally. So starting in elementary school, in high school, it's a great place to start to just get used to expressing yourself and not being afraid. So then on that note, Ethan, let me ask you, you were part of every one of our seminars. What, is, what was the most significant lesson or tool that you took away from that series that you said, hey, this is gonna help me be a better leader and communicator moving forward. Ethan, go. One of the most important things we learned is definitely contact because that can reel somebody in just looking at the camera, it makes someone listen to you more. That's probably one of the most important things because you want to reel people in whenever you're talking. So hold on, you've been in all these classes and now you know, as we take this program in the summer of 2022, uh, previously there were a lot of remote classes. Did you find teachers as well as students not knowing where to look until you started doing this seminar with us? Uh, yeah, definitely. I don't know who to look at, no, and I've seen a lot of people not know what to look at either. And it really throws me and everybody else listening to them off because they probably don't even know what they're looking at and doesn't strengthen their point, what they're talking about. So, so think about this, Ethan, Ethan, I'm sorry for interrupting Ethan. One of the things about remote communication is a little delay. Ethan is down here, Shanye is down there, but Shanye, if I'm talking to you, we did this in the seminar. If I'm talking to you here, cause you're on my screen over here, Shanye, but the reality is, I've got to practice looking into that camera. How challenging was that for you, Shanye? Um, it was really challenging to keep my eyes like and directly in front of me rather than to look at like people like as you can say, you're down here on my left side. So yeah, it was really challenging for me. But after practicing after a while, I finally got the hang of it. Well, you know it's interesting, Shanye, and I'll come to Jeremiah in a second. It isn't just these techniques. We asked you to talk about something you care deeply about, something that, frankly, you, you want to lead an effort to change, innovate, improve. Shania, do you remember what you talked about in that seminar series? Yes. So I talked about bettering my community. And um, one may ask, how can you do that? And you can do that by um, more food pantries, more health. Uh, clinics for people that don't have the best health insurance, just more resources for one to better their life. Mm. And this um, this topic was very passionate for me because 
in my community, there are some who don't have the best insurance. And with the economy going into recession, there's very few mothers, many mothers who can't afford to get like um, baby formula. And I just want to be the change in my community. I just want to lead people into the right path to better their life. So there it is. But Jeremiah, let me ask you, <clears throat> do you remember what you talked about? Because we were doing do. mock interviews. We were doing these, these interviews where I was pressing our mm -hmm. students. I, I have to tell you, they were better than most, some of the adults we deal with. Do you remember what you talked about, Jeremiah? I do. It was specifically health disparities. Why did, why does that matter to you? So health disparities matter to me because as an individual of the Latinx community, I can say that I have not only been brushed, but directly affected by these health disparities where family members have been religiously discriminated because of the religion that their culture practices. They have also just been racially discriminated because of just the way that they were created, the way they look. And when we look into today's society, this is not just an issue of oh, um, a person just having, you know, a different ideology, this is a systemic issue as well. What did you take away from the uh, media skills seminar series? We did three seminars together. So something that I took away from this is being able to have a, an ear for just what is actually coming out of my mouth. Whenever you're addressing a certain audience, you really want to make sure that you know what it is that you are telling your audience. You want to make sure that you are not always being caught up on ums and ands. You want to make sure that whatever is coming out of your mouth is coherent and fluent. Jeremiah, let me ask you something. I remember the first seminar we did, and I, I watched each one of you go, Tony, Mary, myself, we watched each one of you grow. The first seminar where I said, listen, I'm going to do an interview with you. Were you nervous at all? And if so, how did that change over time? I'd say during the first seminar, I was definitely nervous when I heard that there was going to be an interview because I personally was not very confident in my skills speaking online. But as the seminars went on, I was able to better refine my answers to what it is that I really want to pursue in the future and also just how to address myself online overall. So Tony and Mary have these big grins, big happy <laughs> smiles. Tony, why are you smiling? I'm smiling because I saw the growth. Uh, all of these students, you know, we know participated throughout the school year in the stand and deliver workshops. And then they were recommended by their workshop leaders. And they also volunteered basically to participate in these really specialized seminars. So they had a high level of interest in the beginning. And in just those three sessions, we saw so much growth. And for them to be aware of, to have the self-awareness about the growth that they um, experienced, I think is really important. Hey, Mary, what about this? We talk about the adults that we coach and train in leadership and communication. And we talk about the importance of giving feedback. Sometimes that feedback is critical. Sometimes it's not, oh, wow, that was terrific, but we talk specifically about what needs to be improved and changed. And it can be hard for people. You've got, Ethan, how old are you? I'm 14. Jeremiah, how old? 16. Shanye? 17. Mary? <laughs> except, I, just, except, I just keep shaking my head. And, and it, it's so funny. And I know we, we've said it a million times within the seminars. And I literally got goosebumps twice just watching and listening to each of you because you truly are the leaders of tomorrow. You're taking a risk, just uh, electing to sign up for these media skills seminars, as Jeremiah said, not really knowing, you know, oh, wait, I'm going to be interviewed and then embracing it and coming back. Sure, you showed up for the first one, but you didn't need to come back for the subsequent seminars. Sure. You didn't need to show up here today. And you did. And not only are you teaching everyone here today uh, just about what youth leaders can do, you just shared of yourself. And we thank you for that. Yeah, along those lines, Ethan, let me ask you something. I was giving and they're like, who's Steve Adubato? They're like, why is he interviewing? Well, we do this, Ethan. I give you constructive feedback. Some of it's critical other than how great you are. And then you come back, you do it again and again and again. Why'd you, why'd you go come to every seminar, take the feedback, work on it and get better? Why did you do that? You didn't have to. You didn't really get any points for this. I came back because 
I think, I believe that the criticism is necessary to hone my craft. I want to speak more about my ideals. I want to make the world a better place. And to do that, I need to hone my speaking skills. So this criticism is absolutely necessary for me to change the world, be the leader that this world needs. How'd you get so mature? It's probably due to my father. He didn't really uh, baby me <laughs> in a, as a young age. So <laughs> you are still a young age. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When I was a kid, you're 14. When I was a kid. <laughs> Sonia, let me let me let me come back to you. Sonia, you kept coming back. And again, I remember your first media we'll called a QA. And by the way, you can watch the president or the previous president and other top level officials often not handling a QA particularly well or having all these notes in front of them. I got to read my notes or getting angry at a reporter who asked a tough question. I'm pressing each one of you, Sonia, when I pressed you, you stayed focused. You were confident, you made some mistakes and you came back and said, I want to do it again. Why? Um, well, because I felt the need to. I felt like I had a purpose. Like, um, I just felt the need to basically. Shanley, let me stay with this. And, and, and by the way, I want to be clear, this is not easy to do this right now, but Shanley, I'm curious about this. You have, each one of you come from uh, urban communities. And one of the things we've talked about in our Stand and Deliver program that Mary and I started 22 years ago, along with Tony Richardson, is that not much is expected of young people in urban communities from a lot of folks across this state, across the nation. They just don't expect much, mostly because they don't know who you are and what you bring to the table. Shanye, what is one thing about you that you believe over time will make you a really great leader? I'm very outgoing and I don't take no for an answer. So I'll just keep going and going and going until I, until I do it. Jeremiah Smith, you're, you're potentially a great, you're, you're a strong leader with great potential now. You will be a great leader down the road because, Jeremiah? I think it's mostly because of my honesty and transparency, especially when it comes down to the lives of people that are being played with. I'd say in the political world and also in the healthcare system, this is something that we need transparency and honesty to address completely. Mm. Tony, what has this program done for you? What this program has done for me as an educator is just allow me, I'm a retired educator. So working um, with Stand and Deliver and working with the students here, allows me to stay in contact with young people and that's been important you know my whole life like a lot of people don't understand what young people are saying aren't connected to what they're going through and even though I'm not in the classroom now working with this program has allowed me to stay in touch with the pulse of, of young people uh, in our community. You know Mary I'm going to remind folks our Stand and Deliver program has had hundreds and hundreds of young people standing and delivering, doing, making presentations about issues they care deeply about. The theme is be the change. What change do you propose? What role will you play in making that change in your community? If you go on our website, which I, I hope our team puts up right now at steveadovado.org, Mary, people click on stand and deliver, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you click on stand and deliver. It takes you to past videos from our previous Night of Eloquence events. It also takes you to photos, our curriculum. And it's just been a great run. I mean, Steve and I have worked together for 22 years and all 22 of them, I've been closely involved with the Stand and Deliver Initiative. And it's just truly been my honor and pleasure to meet so many young adults, many of whom have come back to be the workshop leaders with the program. So that just goes to show you that, you know, no matter how old you are, 15, 17, 18, you truly can make a difference. So I thank each and every one of you for being here today and for letting our audience know just the, the message that you have. To Jeremiah's. To Shanye, to Ethan, we can't thank you enough for trusting us. For you didn't know me, you didn't know us. You volunteered to be part of this media skills seminar series. And like I said, you didn't get any points, you weren't paid for, you didn't even get a grade. But I am hopeful, prayerful, that each one of you has taken something meaningful from this. And as you move on, 
not just in your education, but in your lives, in your communities, that you use these skills to try to make a difference, to make other people's lives better. We're honored and, and proud, honored to have you and proud of each one of you. Thanks so much. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, Veolia, Resourcing the World, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. Valley's all about making life easier for clients, and that's why we're all about smiles, too. So every day, we make it possible for home buyers to become homeowners, for folks chasing their dreams to become entrepreneurs, for parents to plan today for their children's tomorrow, and for communities to get better every day. You see, when we know we've put a smile on a customer's face, well, that puts one on ours, too. When I started working with children with autism over 25 years ago, my mission began. Autism is a multifaceted spectrum condition, which challenges our system of standard norms. What autism has taught me is that there is no cookie cutter child. Our differences ought to be celebrated, not separated. So today, take a moment to say hi or smile at someone who might be a bit different. Acceptance starts with you. Mary, we just talked to these young leaders in the Stand and Deliver program who went through this media skills seminar series. And, and what's ironic is that, and maybe it's fortuitous, this happens to be the 100th edition of Lessons in Leadership. Sylvester just reminded us of that, or who handles all of our editing and so much more. Uh, how appropriate that this is our 100th broadcast. It is so appropriate. Just seeing the leaders of tomorrow and hearing their voice and 100 years from now when we are not here, it's so great to know that following in our footsteps and really just, you know, making their own trail and their own path. And it just could not be more appropriate. And I can't believe that we have done 100 of these. So Sylvester, thank you so much for reminding us. <laughs> yeah, to Sylvester and, and to Alvin and Frank and Scarlin uh, and Amy and April, who am I missing, Mary? Did you say Frank? And if not, we're going to say him twice. Okay, good. Yeah, Frank, the, the Frank Brown. It's appropriate. And also the, the transition. We interviewed, this is a tape piece that we did a while back with Tom Zaki. Tom Zaki is the founder and CEO of TerraCycle. Tell everyone what TerraCycle is and what the heck I'm it has fascinated. to do with innovation, it, innovation and leadership. His story is amazing. So he talks about how he was at Princeton University as a student, and then he left because he became obsessed with and had a love affair with garbage and trash. And <laughs> it sounds hysterical. True. And it, it's even crazier when you hear what they do. They take dirty baby diapers, they take cigarette butts, and they recycle them. So their, their slogan, and I'm probably just paraphrasing this a little bit, they recycle the unrecyclable. So things that would ordinarily just land in a in a landfill somewhere, they recycle them and find new ways of using them. So to me, there is no greater way to prove innovation truly exists and entrepreneurism exists as well um, just by watching this interview. You know, it's so funny. Uh, people talk about, right, your iPhone. Oh, Steve mm -hmm. Jobs. Oh, my. Yeah, I know. But yes, innovation, leadership, creativity, change the world. But he ain't the only one. Exactly. is not the only one. So that's why we have Tom Zaki from uh, TerraCycle. Check this out for Mary, myself, and our entire team. And for you, everyone watching right now, we thank you for being part of 100 broadcasts of Lessons in Leadership. Hopefully, there's another 100 plus after that. And there would not be any of it if it weren't for Mary Gamba. Check out Mr. Zaki. Talk about innovation. We are honored to be joined by Tom Zaki, who is a founder and CEO of an organization called TerraCycle. Is that right, TerraCycle, Tom? You got it, absolutely, and thanks for having right. me. It's great having you. Uh, based where? 
in Trenton, New Jersey. That's right. We're talking about Trenton. We're talking about innovation, business innovation. Tell everyone what TerraCycle is. So TerraCycle is a global waste management company. Uh, while we are headquartered in Trenton, we operate nationally in 21 countries around the world. And the stuff we do is recycle things no one else recycles, from cigarette butts to dirty diapers, uh, help companies make their products from waste, uh, and even have launched the world's largest reuse platform. So your favorite products in fully reusable packaging. So hold on one second. There's municipal recycling, and then there are companies like yours. What's the difference? Well, so in municipal recycling, what you are recycling is what the garbage company that's contracted can make money at. So an aluminum can, right? The aluminum is valuable enough to uh, incentivize someone to collect it uh, uh, and process it and then make money on whatever they can sell. But 80% of goods you can't recycle locally. Uh, that's everything from a pen you may be writing for, with or to a toothbrush to a coffee capsule. And TerraCycle focuses only on recycling the things that you can't municipally recycle. Uh, by getting a stakeholder uh, who may be interested in it to fund uh, the cost of collecting and processing. How did you get into this? Because my understanding is, um, our, our producer Abby told me that you told her you were at Princeton University. We just actually had the Dean of the Graduate mm. School at Princeton on. We're taping most of the day today. And I'm thinking, so Tom is at Princeton. He leaves Princeton and does this. How does that happen? Yeah, it's exactly right. You know, I, I left in the middle of my, uh, my second year because I got really fascinated first by the concept of purposeful business, you know, viewing profit more as an indicator of health and then using business as a tool for good. And I fell in love with the topic of waste because garbage is filled with all Hold these on, phenomenal you anomalies. Fell on, back up, Tom. Mm, yeah. You fell in love with the topic of waste. That's right. That's Could you right. explain that love affair? Yeah, it's, it's garbage as a topic to me is like eternally fascinating because it is filled with all these anomalies. So I'll give you a, a couple of examples, right? Please. We live in a materialistic world. You know, our status in some part, and maybe in no small part, is linked to the stuff we own. But yep. isn't it interesting that the garbage industry will legally own everything you possess with no exception? One day, all your possessions will be legal property of a garbage company. I mean, that's really odd. And 99% of what you buy becomes property of a garbage company within the year of purchase. How do you recycle dirty diapers? So the most important Scarlet part- Scarlett, our here, cameraman, honestly, just laughed at that. Scarlett, it's a legitimate question. It but is. Seriously, how do you do that? And when, yeah. explain it. Yeah, and you know, and we do it today in Japan, France, and Holland. So it's, it's live in multiple countries. And so the first and most important thing is the business model, right? Collecting right. diapers and processing them is much more expensive than the results are worth. So it's finding a stakeholder, in this example, Pampers, who is excited and willing to fund uh, that solution. And then we set up methods of how do we collect it. We got to make sure it's done safely, do it in ways that consumers will deposit diapers and so on. So we create smart bins that smell control, you know, deploy them in front of retailers. And then we come up with unique technology to be able to turn those diapers into sellable outputs uh, like plastics and cellulosic material and so on. And honestly, each waste stream uh, has a journey like that. Why Trenton, New Jersey? You could be a lot of different places. Why Trenton? Certainly so, yeah. Um, I mean, to be very honest, I, when we, I first left Princeton, I needed to find a facility and Trenton was the closest place that had affordable real estate. That's the honest story. But since being here for 20 years, I have really fallen in love with this town in that it is the best location in the Northeast, uh, you know, right between Manhattan and Philadelphia. We have about 600 team members and many of them live in those cities and commute here. Um, uh, and also the city, you know, both the state and the city uh, government leaders are here to help us. You know, they're coming through our office all the time, helping and thinking through, um, you know, how this company can succeed. So we are, and it's purposeful to be here. You know, it's, uh, it, it benefits the city much more than if we located in Brooklyn or San Francisco or somewhere else that already has a lot of exciting companies in it. How many people do you employ? 600. Six. Wow. In and of itself, the idea, the reality of we employ at any one time, eight to 10 full-time people and a bunch of freelancers who are just incredibly talented and make things happen. Uh, I can't imagine what it must feel like to, to employ 600 people and know that you are helping them um, live their lives, their quality of life, food, shelter. And I'm not saying it, it sounded like you're some sort of uh, benefactor, if you will, but that's, that's got to be rewarding because they're working hard for it, but you're employing 600 people yeah. and contributing to the tax base of Trenton. Yeah. Please, Tom. No, you're absolutely right. It is, uh, I say it's a privilege uh, to be sure able is. to have that opportunity. And uh, it's just such a thrill that we're able to turn 
purposeful business into something that you know, employs all these people, but also, you know, a quarter billion people engage with our programs every day, just folks out there collecting and recycling all over the world. Wait a minute, a quarter billion, because I also That's know right. you have a global footprint. Explain That's that right. to us. Yeah, so, you know, we operate today in 21 countries. In Thailand is a nonprofit, the TerraCycle Foundation, but everywhere else is a mission-driven for-profit. So, you know, from Canada to Japan, uh, all headquartered out of here in Trenton. And today, about 250 million people a year, uh, or sorry, a day, interact with TerraCycle programs. That could be walking into a Walmart and recycling your car seat. It could be, uh, you know, going into the world's largest, uh, sorry, Japan's largest retailer and recycling your cosmetics. Um, and in that process, uh, we don't only collect and recycle millions of pounds of hard to recycle waste, but we also raise capital for charity. So we've donated about $50 million to organizations for helping to collect and recycle this waste. Um, and so this is what we're all about is how do you use the context of for-profit capitalism, which is an incredibly powerful tool, I'd say the most powerful tool in the world today, probably more powerful than war and politics and anything, but to do it where we reframe profit as an indicator of health. I mean, we're profitable and so on, but more as a health indicator than as a reason of being, and then the reason of being can become environmental and social improvement. Wow. In building TerraCycle over 20 years and being in Trenton and employing 600 plus people, et cetera, what's the most significant leadership lesson you've learned over the years? What first comes to mind uh, is how to embrace failure, not to seek it, right? We don't want to seek it. We don't want to be, we want to be, you know, conservative and, uh, and avoid risk. But if you're going to innovate and grow and push the envelope, you certainly will fail. And what I think is so important, the way we approach it, I'm not saying it's the right answer, but it's been a huge unlocking uh, method for us. Is anytime there is a, an issue, a failure of some kind, big or small, the first thing we ask is, what are we going to learn about this? Because there then is. the investment in that failure is like tuition. I mean, we go to school, spend a lot of money to learn, produce nothing, but a lot of education. If you embrace failure as education, the organization will in, be incredibly uh, strong for it. You know, people will take risks. They'll, they'll try new things. They'll push the envelope. And if we fail, then we learn something. And if we don't fail, we succeed. There, in other ways, there's no negative if you do it right. If you criticize and, 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 and uh, failure and, and, and fear it, then people will never want to try to innovate and you'll get stuck where you are. You're listening to a very strong, innovative leader, uh, Tom Sackey, who is founder and CEO of TerraCycle. Hey, Tom, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank Best you. to you and your team. I'm Steve Adubato. That's Tom Zaki. We'll see you next time. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, Veolia, Resourcing the World, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine. CIANJ and Commerce Magazine. Valley is all about making life easier for clients, and that's why we're all about smiles, too. So every day, we make it possible for home buyers to become homeowners, for folks chasing their dreams to become entrepreneurs, for parents to plan today for their children's tomorrow, and for communities to get better every day. You see, when we know we've put a smile on a customer's face, well, that puts one on ours, too. When I started working with children with autism over 25 years ago, my mission began. Autism is a multifaceted spectrum condition, which challenges our system of standard norms. What autism has taught me is that there is no cookie cutter child. Our differences ought to be celebrated, not separated. So today, take a moment to say hi or smile at someone who might be a bit different. Acceptance starts with you.